second part of this teaching on the parable of the ten virgins, we are going to continue to look at this parable and examine some of the details regarding it. And we are going to then take the phrases and break them down and try to understand the deeper spiritual meaning of what Yeshua was trying to teach in this parable as it is connected to the question that was asked of him in Matthew in chapter 24, verse 3. What's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so ultimately then, why was it that the foolish virgins were unprepared for Yeshua's return and what caused the wise virgins to be prepared for his return. And his return then is associated with him coming for his bride and marrying his bride. But what in the scriptures is likened and associated with a wedding? And so that's what we are going to look at in greater detail in the second part of this teaching. So in Matthew in chapter 25 in verse 6, it is written, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out and meet him. And so in examining this cry and taking it back in Hebraic context, the Feast of Trumpets, more commonly called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, is referred to in the scriptures as Yom Teruah, or the Day of the Awakening Blast. And a Teruah can be translated as a shout or a cry. So Yeshua was making a reference to a loud shout, a loud cry. And what is going to be associated with that loud shout or that cry, it's going to be the sound of the shofar. Because we're told in Isaiah, in chapter 27, verse 13, that a shofar will be blown to gather the exiles of Israel, as it is written. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great shofar will be blown and they will come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt. That is the exile in the nations of the world. And they will return and worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 6 It says at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out and meet him. So what's the deeper meaning behind this phrase? Go out to meet him. Well, in a biblical marriage, the groom is welcomed under the hoopah or the wedding canopy. And in the book Made in Heaven by Rabbi Ari Kaplan, on page 156, he explains, When the groom approaches the hoopah, or the wedding canopy, the cantor chants, Blessed is he who comes. And that this is an idiomatic expression meaning welcome. Because the groom is greeted like a king under the hoopah. And Matthew Chapter 23, verse 37 and verse 39, Yeshua said regarding his return that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so in reflecting upon Jerusalem, and so Yeshua is looking at the literal city, but spiritually Jerusalem is associated with Yeshua's bride. So Matthew twenty three thirty seven. he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and then in verse 39, For I say unto you, you will not see me again until you say, 
Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So this phrase is associated with the welcoming of the groom as a king in a biblical wedding. So Yeshua was saying that in his return for his bride, he is going to be welcomed as a king. And the one who gathers and unites the exiles of Israel is seen in Judaism as the kingly Messiah. Now, looking at Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, it says, At midnight was the cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out and meet him. What's the deeper meaning and understanding of this? Well, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Why? For the day of the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. And so what is the day of the Lord associated with? It is a day of darkness and gloominess. And so then we can see that Why is the cry made for the bridegroom to come at midnight? It is because the end of the exile of northern kingdom, southern kingdom, northern kingdoms, the house of Joseph, the ten tribes, or Ephraim, the southern kingdom, is the house of Judah. We are told when that end of the exile and return to the land is going to take place. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3, it is written, For lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, that's northern kingdom, and Judah, southern kingdom, says the Lord. And I'm going to cause them to return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they will possess it. And this is associated with a period of time known as Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble is a term for the tribulation period. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. What day? The day when Israel and Judah returns to the land. That day is great. What day? The day of the Lord. The day that's darkness and gloominess. So that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved or redeemed or delivered out of it. In other words, it is during Jacob's trouble that there will be the end of the exile and Jacob will return to the land of Israel. And so it's the role and the task and the function of the Messiah to accomplish this task. Yeshua stated to the Pharisees when he was asked at the end of John in chapter 9 and then in verse 40, the question, are we blind? Yeshua's reply entailed the following in John chapter 10, verse 11. He said, I am the good shepherd. He repeats it in John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. And then in John chapter 10, verse 15, he says that the good shepherd is going to lay down his life for the sheep. Now, we're told in Ezekiel in chapter 34 and then verses 11 and 12, that the exiles of Israel are going to be gathered by Yahweh Elohim, the good shepherd, and they're going to be gathered and they're going to return to the mountains of Israel in the cloudy and dark day. As it is written, thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I will both seek my sheep and gather them. I will seek out my sheep and I will deliver them out of all the places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And so the return is Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 13. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them upon the mountains of Israel. And so the gathering of northern kingdom, southern kingdom, Israel and Judah to the land, ending their exile, takes place 
in the cloudy and dark day, which is a reference to the time associated with the day of the Lord. And because this is Jacob's trouble, that's why that cry in, in Hebraic understanding and thought process, that's the sound of the shofar is being sounded and you are to be ready for the coming of the bridegroom. Now, we see in Revelation in chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14 that the exiles of Israel will be gathered and united during the time of the Great Tribulation. There's a question that is asked in Revelation chapter 7 verse 13. Who are these in white robes and where did they come? And the answer is they came out of Great Tribulation. So regarding those that came out of great tribulation, it is said of them in Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, they will hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb, that's a reference to the Messiah, will lead them unto living fountains of water. So the answer in Revelation chapter 7 regarding who are these that came out of great tribulation, which we just shared with you from Revelation chapter 7 verses 16 and 17, that is a quote of Isaiah chapter 49 verse 10 as it is written. They will not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that has mercy on them, and in Revelation 7, the one that has mercy is the Lamb, that's the Messiah, he will lead them even by springs of water. And so that cry that's being made at midnight to be ready to greet the bridegroom, it is for the purpose of the exiles of Israel prepared to be led by the Messiah from their places of exile back to the land of Israel. And it's going to take place at midnight. It's going to take place during Jacob's trouble. It's going to take place during the days of the Great Tribulation. And now we're told in Psalm 137, verse 1, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down, we wept, whenever we remembered Zion. And we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. So we can see, poetically speaking, that in exile by the rivers of Babylon, that you're not able to sing, you weep. And in Babylon, in exile you're not able to play your harp because it's sitting on the willow tree. And what's another name for the willow tree? It's commonly called the weeping willow tree. And it goes on to say in Psalm 137, verse 3, For there they that carried us away captive into Babylon, into the nations of the world, they're mocking And they require of us a song and they say, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the reply is, how? How can we sing the Lord's song? So what is the Lord's song? The Lord's song is the song of Zion. And you cannot sing that song by the rivers of Babylon because you're sitting down, you're weeping. And the instrument by which you're going to sing the harp, which is associated with King David, who ruled over all 12 tribes from Jerusalem, which is called Zeom. You can't do it if your harp is hanging on the willow. You cannot sing the song of Zeon. You cannot sing the Lord's song in exile, in Babylon, in a strange land. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 3, we see a group of people who get the victory over the beast, over his mark, over his image, and over the number of his name. And what are they doing? They're singing the song of Moses. And historically, when was the song of Moses sung? It's in Exodus chapter 15, and it happened 
when Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea and the children of Israel were ultimately and finally free from Pharaoh in Egypt and their oppression there. And they sing the song of Moses, so that's associated with redemption. And they sing the song of the Lamb. So what is the song of the Lamb? It is the song of Zion. What's the song of Zion? It's the end of the exile of the house of Jacob. And you cannot sing that song by the rivers of Babylon or in exile. So those that are singing that song during the days of the great tribulation, they're doing so because in Revelation 15 verse 2, they get the victory over the beast, over his mark, over his image, and over the number of his name. And so you cannot get the victory over his beast and his mark and his image and the number of his name if there isn't the obstacle to do so. So the beast and his mark and his image and his number of his name must be present in order for you to be in a battle against the beast, the mark and his image and the number of his name. And then therefore able to overcome the beast, his mark, his image and the number of his name. And in getting the victory, they have harps. And so if they're playing their hearts, then they're not in Babylon. They're not in exile because how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So let's summarize this part of the examination of the parable of the ten virgins where we looked at key words and phrases from Matthew in chapter 25 in verse 6. So, a cry was made to meet the bridegroom. And one of the sounds of the shofar is a teruah, which means a loud shout or a loud cry. And this is a reference to the exiles of Israel who will be gathered by the blowing of the shofar, Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. And this cry to meet the bridegroom was made at midnight. Midnight is a reference to Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation. And the exiles of Israel are gathered, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 and 12, in the day of the Lord. And in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloominess. So the exiles of Israel are gathered during the time of the Great Tribulation. As we saw in Revelation chapter 7. And it's the Messiah who gathers the exiles of Israel. And the gathering from exile... And from oppression, when you're free, you want to rejoice, you want to praise, you want to sing. And so the end of the exile is likened to a song. And because it's the Messiah who gathers and unites the 12 tribes of Israel, they sing the song of the Lamb. Continuing and looking at the parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew chapter 25, verse 7, it is written, then all the virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. Arising is a Hebrew idiom for awakening from spiritual slumber. And when you are not following the Torah, you are regarded as being in spiritual slumber. And the bride of Yeshua is called to be awakened out of her spiritual slumber and being ready and prepared to meet her bridegroom. Psalm 102, verse 13, it says, You will arise and have mercy on Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, it is written, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 6, it is written, For there shall be a day that the watchman upon Mount Ephraim will cry, Arise, 
and let us go up to Zion. And so the arising is so that you could go to Zion, which is Jerusalem, and be ready for the marriage of Yeshua's bride to him. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zeom. Put on your beautiful garments. And those beautiful garments are the white robes from Revelation and chapter 7. And... In John, in chapter 15, Yeshua said in verse 3, You are made clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. And so the white robes are associated with them being clean. It's through the word. And so following the Torah or the word of God is the means by which we can have clean and white robes because otherwise we do not want our robes to be spotted by the world, the ways of the world, the values of the world. And we're told in 1 John 3, 4 that sin is the transgression of the Torah. And so sin causes a spotted garment. And what causes the spot? transgressing the Torah. So what causes the garment to be clean and white? When you are living a holy and sanctified life. And so if sin is transgressing the Torah, holiness is following the Torah. In Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2, it is written, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And so when Jerusalem, a term for the bride of Messiah, is called to arise and shine and awaken out of her spiritual slumber, what is it associated with? Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. So that's why the cry was made at midnight, because it's a reference to Jacob's trouble in the Great Tribulation. And it's a reference to that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the bride is called to arise during this time because the glory of the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 7, it says, Then all the virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. We are told in Matthew chapter 25, verse 8, that the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, because our lamps are gone out. And in the Torah, in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, there's a commandment, that the lampstand was to burn always. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. And so the foolish virgins allowed their lamps to go out. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, it is written, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And so... The foolish virgins, they did not arise and return to the Torah. And they lost their zeal for Yeshua and following after him. And then in Matthew chapter 25, verse 9, the wise virgins responded by saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and also for you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And so why is the wise virgins concerned that there's might not be enough oil for them and the foolish virgins? It's because these things are taking place at midnight when 
darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. And so they need their light in order to shine through the time of darkness to be prepared for the bridegroom's return. It's the wise virgins who are ready for the marriage. And while they went to buy, that is the foolish virgins, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. In the book Made in Heaven by Rabbi Ari Kaplan on page 206, he explains that immediately after the guests finish congratulating the bride and the groom for the exchanging of their vows underneath the hoopah, the couple exit toward the seclusion room. And the bride and groom are led to the seclusion room amid singing and dancing. And after the wedding ceremony is over, it is customary for the bride and the groom to be alone in the seclusion room for a short period of time. Now, there are two primary stages in a biblical wedding. And this is explained in the book Made in Heaven by Rabbi Ari Kaplan on page 166. He explains, The wedding ceremony consists of two main parts. The first part is a rusin or kedushin, also called betrothal, and the second part is Nisuin, or when bride and groom physically, they then consummate the marriage and they live together as husband and wife. And so betrothal is marriage. It's legally binding marriage, but during the betrothal process, you do not physically dwell with your spouse. You do not consummate the marriage. And because betrothal is legally binding, even though the marriage has not been consummated, that the legally binding aspect of the marriage in order to get out of the relationship, it requires that there be a divorce. And so betrothal, You're legally married, but you do not physically dwell with. And spiritually, this is going to be likened to what Christians refer to as salvation. Whenever you accept Yeshua as Savior and Lord of your life, then you are in a legal relationship with him that in the Bible is likened unto a marriage. But Yeshua is not physically dwelling with you at this moment in time. The second part of the marriage is when Yeshua is going to return and physically dwell with his bride. He's going to do so first when he sets up his kingdom, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, teaching the Torah to all nations, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3. Then he's going to continue to physically dwell with his bride for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth and specifically in the New Jerusalem. And so we can see how betrothal is legally binding, and in order to get out of betrothal, it requires a divorce, even though the marriage has not yet been consummated. And we can see this from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, regarding the status of Yeshua's parents' Mary and Joseph at the time that Yeshua was born. It is written, Now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused or betrothed to Joseph before they came together, before they consummated the marriage, she was found of child of the Holy Spirit. And so now Joseph initially believes that Mary was unfaithful to him during the betrothal, even though they had not consummated the marriage. And so it was in his thoughts to get a divorce from Mary. 
Matthew chapter 1 verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Put her away means to get a divorce. But the angel of the Lord then came into the situation and explained to Joseph what was going on. And as a result, Joseph did not get a divorce from Miriam because Miriam was not unfaithful. The child that was in her came from a virgin birth because she, the child was in her womb through the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, this is the way that we have the spiritual status of being betrothed to Yeshua. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so that salvation that we have through the redemptive work of Yeshua when he died on the tree and shed his blood comes when we repent of our sins and ask him to come into our heart and our lives, make him Savior and Lord of our lives. And that redemption and that salvation and us then being betrothed to Yeshua in a marriage relationship comes through the shedding of his blood on the tree. As we can see in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Yeshua said in John chapter 14 verse 15. If you love me keep my commandments. So now once we are a part of Yeshua's family. Once we're betrothed to him. Once we're in the marriage relationship. Because we've repented of our sins and we've received his shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins, we are to remain loyal and faithful until he returns for us at his second coming, where it's then that we enter into the second stage of the marriage. And in us being faithful to him, Yeshua said, Now, if you love me, keep my commandments. When Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he was making a reference to the very first place in the Bible where we see the phrase, love me and keep my commandments. So it's found in Exodus in chapter 20, verse 6. And the here it's describing what's happening at Mount Sinai. And it says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the word love me and keep my commandments was first said at Mount Sinai regarding the way in which the children of Israel was to respond to the act of mercy, compassion, loving kindness and redeeming his people out of Egypt. And when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the means by which their deliverance came out of Egypt, that foreshadowed Yeshua being the lamb of God, him dying on the tree, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And just as the response of the children of Israel to that redemption out of Egypt was to come to Mount Sinai, receive daily instruction about how they were to live their lives through the Torah. And then they were to show that love to the one that redeemed them out of Egypt by keeping his commandments. So even so, Yeshua said to those who he has saved through his shed blood, that they are to express their love to him by loving him, keeping his commandments, which means following his Torah. And Yeshua said that he would abide and dwell with those who keep his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 21. He that has my commandments that follows his Torah and keeps them, 
He it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. You keep my commandments. I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. John chapter 14, verse 23. Yeshua answered and said, If a man loves me, he will keep my words or my commandments. And my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we can see that the end of the exile is likened to a wedding and the joy of a wedding. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 10 and 11, verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. So Yeshua said in John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14, that he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd is going to gather the exiles of Israel, and the one that gathers is also the one that scattered. So it was Yeshua who scattered the exiles of Israel. And why did Israel get scattered in the nations? Because they broke the covenant at Mount Sinai. And so the one who entered into covenant with them at, at Mount Sinai, because they broke the covenant, they were scattered. And he that scattered is the one that gathers. So from this, we can see that Yeshua is not only the good shepherd, but he's the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And because his people was unfaithful to him to follow and keep his Torah, they were exiled into the nations. And then it says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 11, For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. That's ending the exile of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 13 Then will the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. So when he that scattered Israel gathers him, when he redeems Jacob from the nations where he's been scattered, that is both northern kingdom and southern kingdom, that is likened to marriage and the joy of a marriage. Then will the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 7. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. And so this is likened to a wedding and the joy of a wedding. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 10 and 11. Thus says the Lord, again, there shall be heard in this place, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. That's wedding talk. And so what is associated with wedding talk in a marriage? The voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, says the Lord. And so the way that we're to understand how this is going to come about is the principle that the way in which Messiah is going to gather the exiles of Israel and bring them back to the land is patterned after the way the children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt. Hosea chapter 2 verse 15. And I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor. Now Achor in Hebrew means trouble or troubling. And so the spiritual meaning is the valley of trouble. The valley of trouble. And so it's a spiritual reference to Jacob's trouble. So Jacob's trouble, the valley of trouble, is going to be the door of hope. And she shall sing there. So when is she singing? Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. When she gets the victory over the beast and his mark and the image and the number of his name, then there's going to be the singing of the song of Moses and singing of the song of the Lamb. And so the time of Jacob's trouble and the time of the great tribulation is a time of hope because that is when the Messiah is going to end the exile of his people and return them back to the land and the gathering uniting of the exiles of Israel and their return back to the land by the Messiah, that that is likened to a wedding. 
So she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Then in Micah chapter 7, verse 15, according to the days of your coming out of the land of Egypt, according to those days, will I in the future show him marvelous things. So let's summarize this part of the parable as we've taken key words and phrases and broke them down and showed you and defined for you the meaning of them. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Arise represents awakening from spiritual slumber, which means returning to the Torah. The foolish virgins let their lamps go out. And the Torah is likened unto a lamp. Proverbs in chapter 6 In verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the Torah is light. So the foolish virgins quit and did not follow the Torah. The lamp represents following the Torah. And in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, the commandment is to not allow the lampstand to quit burning The foolish virgins had no oil in their lamps. The wise virgins were ready for the marriage. The uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel is likened to a marriage. So therefore, the wise virgins were ready and prepared for the Messiah to return to end their exile and to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel, taking them back to the land. There are two stages to the biblical marriage. And the first is betrothal, where you are legally married to your spouse, but you do not physically dwell with your spouse. And then the second stage of the marriage called Nesuin, when you physically dwell with your spouse and consummate the marriage. During betrothal, you're legally married, but you do not physically dwell with your spouse. And since betrothal is legal marriage, it requires a divorce to get out of the marriage. All who have accepted Yeshua as their savior for the forgiveness of their sins are spiritually betrothed to him. And in being spiritually betrothed to Yeshua, we're to keep our lamps burning. We're to love him, keep his commandments and If we know and understand what the Torah and the prophets say regarding Israel being exiled into the nations of the world, we will know that the Messiah is coming to end the exile of his people. So Yeshua is going to return for a bride to complete the second stage of the marriage where he will physically dwell with his bride first in his kingdom that he sets up and then ultimately for all eternity where the bride will dwell with Yeshua forever in the new Jerusalem. So the foolish virgins missed the marriage. What are they missing? They're missing Messiah's return to gather and unite the exiles of Israel. So the foolish virgins in Matthew chapter 25 verse 11 It says, afterward came the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And what was told the foolish virgins is, I do not know you. Now, if we take this back to Hebraic thought, know is the Hebrew word yada, and it means to know intimately. So Yeshua was rebuking the foolish virgins for not knowing him intimately. An example where the word yada is used and it refers to an intimate relationship is in Genesis in chapter 4 verse 1 where it says in Adam yada Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived. Now in Matthew chapter 7 verse 23 Yeshua gives a rebuke and he says, then I will profess unto them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me. And the King James says, you that work iniquity. And so this word iniquity in the Greek is anomia. And it's the same Greek word that's translated in 1 John 3, 4 as transgressing the Torah. Sin is anomia. Sin is transgressing the Torah. So the rebuke that Yeshua is giving is that this group of people does not know him intimately because while they're doing good works for Yeshua, they are not following and advocating following his Torah. We can see in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the Torah. This is the... Greek word anomia, it's the number 458 in the Strong's Greek Dictionary. So, if we translate Matthew in chapter 7, verse 23, the same way that the King James translates anomia in 1 John 3, 4, then Yeshua's words were, depart from me, you that don't follow my Torah, you that transgress the Torah. Now, in these verses, Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And so back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He's not rebuking them for these works that they're doing in his name. They're being rebuked for not knowing him in an intimate way, meaning they are not aware that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai and thus they should be following his Torah. So Yeshua says not Everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And so what is the will of the heavenly Father? It breaks down into two major things. The first, it's the will of the Father to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. John chapter 6, verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And then Yeshua said in John chapter 6, verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. So that's one element of the will of the Father is to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Those that are doing the good works of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 They believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But when the disciples ask Yeshua, show us how to pray, he said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, After this manner pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's the will of the heavenly Father that his will be done on earth even as his will is being done in heaven. So what is that will in addition to believing that Yeshua is the Messiah? Psalm chapter 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your Torah is within my heart. So it's the will of the Heavenly Father to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah and that Yeshua's Torah be written on your heart. Well, that's what the new covenant is. The new covenant, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, and Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 is the Torah written upon our heart. We can see this, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, but this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my Torah in their inward parts, and I will write the Torah in their hearts. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, for finding fault with them. And so, what was it about his people that he found fault with? He found fault that they had stony hearts. So as we're told in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, the God of Israel desired to remove the stony heart and replace it with the heart of flesh. 
And in doing so, Hebrews 8, 8 says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And Hebrews 8, 10, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my Torah in their mind and I will write it in their hearts. And so this new heart is prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and do them. So the will of the Heavenly Father is to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and that his Torah be written upon our heart by the Holy Spirit. And this is the way that Paul expressed his faith in Yeshua as the Messiah because he testified in Romans chapter 7, verse 22. I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man. And so who Yeshua is rebuking in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 is the same rebuke that he's given to the foolish virgins. He says, I don't know you. I don't know you intimately. Because if you know Yeshua intimately, you will not only know that he's your savior, but you will also study the scriptures and understand that it's Yeshua that created the heavens and the earth. It's Yeshua that made covenant with Abraham. And it's Yeshua that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And in the New Testament, in James chapter 4, verse 12, it says, there's one lawgiver who is able to save. In other words, the one that is able to save is the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And who is the one that saves? It's Yeshua. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she, Mary, shall bring forth a son, and you will call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. We can see that Yeshua is our savior in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. And Yeshua not only created the heavens and the earth, John chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 10, and Paul states in Colossians 1, chapter 15, and Paul also states it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, but Yeshua is also the judge of the world. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that, to that which he has done, whether good or bad. And so Yeshua is the king of kings. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. So John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Yeshua is the word of God. And regarding the word of God in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, it says... He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And so if we take Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it says, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That verse makes four claims regarding the Lord. He saves us. Well, we just looked at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, that Yeshua saves his people from their sins. And that the Lord is our king. We looked at. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13 and verse 16, that the one that's the word of God is the king of kings. And then Yeshua is our judge. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Yeshua. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. So the one that saves us, the one that is our king, the one that is our judge, is also the lawgiver. It gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And so... Yeshua is rebuking the foolish virgins because they do not know him intimately. They do not know that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And they do not know that it's the role and the task and the function of the Messiah to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. That when Yeshua returns at his second coming, he's completing his redemptive work 
from his first coming and that is to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's see how Yeshua's ministry is to gather the exiles of Israel. In the book, I await his coming every day by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson on page 18. He explains from the writings of Moses Maimonides, who's called the Rambam, and in his work Mishnah Torah, where he took all of rabbinical teachings, Jewish law, and categorized them by various subjects and enumerated the laws concerning those subjects. One section is called the laws of the kings. And so the Messiah is to be a kingly Messiah. So in the laws of the kings, chapter 11, section 4, Maimonides writes, if a king will arise from the house of David, if he does a variety of things, that includes gathering the exiles of Israel, he is definitely the Messiah. So, in the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 2, page 957, the Midrash Rabbah is rabbinical teaching on primarily the Torah portions, but it includes the Hebrew scriptures as well. What purpose will the royal Messiah come and what will he do? The royal Messiah, the kingly Messiah, will gather the exiles of Israel. We can see that the Messiah gathers the exiles of Israel from the book A Matter of Return by Rabbi Raphael Eisenberg on page 131, quoting from Isaiah in chapter 11 that Isaiah foresaw that in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which is Isaiah in chapter 11. And verse 1, and then it says that stands for a banner of the people, and in him shall the nations seek, and it says his resting place shall be glorious. And so that's Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10. And it shall come to pass on that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamat, and from the isles of the sea. That's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. And he will set up a banner for the nations and shall assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12. So from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and verses 10 through 12, we learn that the Messiah will gather the exiles of Israel. He will gather northern kingdom, the ten tribes, the house of Joseph, Ephraim, along with the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, in the book, A Matter of Return by Rabbi Raphael Eisenberg on page 129 and 130, he explains that there's a rabbinical or a Talmudic dispute as to whether the ten tribes of the northern kingdom who was initially taken captive by the Assyrians, whether they will ever return and be united with the southern kingdom of the house of Judah. And so Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Akiva proclaimed Bar Kukba as the Messiah and one of the Jewish revolts against Rome, Rabbi Akiva said that the ten tribes will not return. And so Rabbi Akiva saw that there was un- no uniting of northern kingdom and southern kingdom in the first century because he said that they're not ever going to return. However, Rabbi Eliezer said that the ten tribes will return and their return is in the end of days. And so the rabbis concluded from, and as explained in the book of Matter of Return by Rabbi Raphael Eisenberg on page 130, that the halakha or the position of Judaism on the matter is that the ten tribes will return and be joined with the Jewish people at the end of days. And then, referring to the book, A Matter of Return by Rabbi Raphael Eisenberg on page 130, according 
to Rabbi Arbabanel that the return of the ten tribes at the time of the redemption or the time of the coming of King Messiah in Messianic times is one of the principles of Jewish faith. And the reference there is Mashmia Yeshua, the fourth principle of faith. And so the way that Yeshua redeemed his people at his first coming when he brought in the new covenant, which consisted of the Torah being written upon our hearts, was through his shed blood on the tree. And this was prophesied in Zechariah in chapter 9. And in verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey, upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Yeshua, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey before he was put on trial and ultimately crucified. And then in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11, it is written, And as for you, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth your prisoners. The prisoners are the exiles of Israel out of the pit. And the prisoners are defined in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13, as Judah and Ephraim. When I bent Judah for me, that is the southern kingdom, the Jewish people, and filled the bow with Ephraim. That's the house of Joseph. That is the northern kingdom. And so at Yeshua's first coming, the redemption was by the blood of the Lamb, even as the children of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt by putting the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost. And so whenever we receive Yeshua's shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins, whenever we make confession and ask Yeshua to come into our heart and our life to be Savior and Lord of our lives, in Christianity, this is called salvation or being saved. And biblically, that is associated with the first stage of the biblical marriage betrothal. And so once you're betrothed, you're to remain faithful. And Yeshua defined that faithfulness by loving him and keeping his commandments so that when he returns for his bride to then um, have the second stage of the marriage where he will physically dwell with his spouse that she will be ready for his return and messiah's second coming is to complete the redemptive work which is going to entail gathering and uniting the exiles of israel so the pharisees ask yeshua in john chapter 9 verse 40 are we blind and when Yeshua gave the answer to the question, he explained to the Pharisees an area where they are blind. They are blind to the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah, that he is the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14, Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd. And they're blind to the fact that the Messiah, the good shepherd, is going to have to die, is going to have to lay down his life. John chapter 10, verse 15, Yeshua said, I lay down my life for the sheep. And so when Yeshua was telling the Pharisees that he's the good shepherd, he was also making a reference to the role of the good shepherd to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel, pointing them back to Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11 and verse 13, where it says, Thus says the Lord God, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And so one thing that the Pharisees are blind toward, in addition to Yeshua being the Messiah, and that he's going to be the one to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel, they're blind to knowing and accepting who their brethren are of the northern kingdom. And that the Messiah is going to come to bring restoration to the northern kingdom who was cut off from the covenant as prophesied in the book of Hosea in Hosea chapter 1. 
and were given a bill of divorce in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, but was promised restoration in Hosea chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. As it is written, Hosea chapter 1 verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it will come to pass in the place where it was said, You are not my people. There will be said, You are the sons of the living God. That's the restoration. And so they're going to go from being not my people, that means cut off from the covenant, to returning to the covenant to be a son of the living God. That is someone who believes in Yeshua as the Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 12. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God. And then, in the fullness of restoration and reconciliation and return, the northern kingdom is going to be joined with the southern kingdom. Hosea chapter 1 verse 11. Then the children of Israel and the children of Judah will be gathered together. And when we have the gathering uniting the 12 tribes of Israel, that's when all 12 tribes will agree on who the Messiah is. They will appoint themselves one head. So in addressing the Pharisees' question at the end of John chapter 9, Yeshua says to them in John chapter 10 verse 16, Other sheep I have. Now, he didn't say other sheep I will have after I die, and they believe that I'm the Messiah. At the time that Yeshua is speaking to the Pharisees, before he dies on the tree, Yeshua says, I have another sheepfold, which is not this fold. So he's speaking to Pharisees who are of the house of Judah, and Yeshua is claiming that the Pharisees who do not believe that he's the Messiah that they are a part of his fold. And then he adds to that, that he has another sheepfold that's not them. And so how does Yeshua have two sheepfolds when he has not yet died on the tree? The only way that that's possible is if Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, because the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai entered into covenant with the house of Jacob and then when the house of Jacob comes into the promised land, ultimately King David rules over all 12 tribes from Jerusalem, but following his days and the days of Solomon, they were split into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And so northern kingdom is a sheepfold, southern kingdom is a sheepfold, and they are still Yeshua's people. And then Yeshua explains that them, the other sheepfold, I must bring. Why must he bring the other sheepfold, the northern kingdom? Because the Torah requires that you are to redeem your firstborn son. And in Jeremiah, in chapter 31, the northern kingdom, it says of them in Jeremiah, in chapter 31 verse 9 that Ephraim is my firstborn and then in Jeremiah 31 verse 20 Ephraim is my dear son so Ephraim the firstborn that they were cut off from the covenant because the first king of the northern kingdom Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim and he led the northern kingdom as in the succeeding kings of the northern kingdom followed after the sins of Jeroboam and he caused the northern kingdom to depart from following the Torah. And their penalty or their judgment was that they were cut off. And so now we have the firstborn cut off from the covenant. The Torah requires that you redeem your firstborn. And so now Yeshua, heaven's firstborn, is going to come to the earth to redeem the firstborn of the house of Jacob. And so he's following the Torah and doing this. Them I must bring and they will hear my voice. That is because we're told in Psalm in chapter 80 and verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Yeshua just said in John chapter 10, verse 11 and verse 14, He's the good shepherd. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph like a flock. And so Joseph would be led by the good shepherd. 
and would be led and believe in the Messiah. And so he says, they will hear my voice. And then ultimately there will be one fold. The two sheep folds will become one and there'll be one shepherd over them. And so in telling the Pharisees that Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom who were exiled in the nations and who are separated from each other here in the first century, that in the fullness of time, they will be gathered in united by the Messiah. He said he's the good shepherd. There'll be one shepherd over them. That means he's going to be over the, the two houses of Israel when they are gathered and united and returned back to the land. But before he's going to physically gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel, he has to bring the northern kingdom back into covenant relationship through the new covenant, through him shedding his blood. So that's why he explains to the Pharisees in John chapter 10, verse 17. Therefore, does my father love me because I lay down my life? There's ultimately going to be two sheepfolds that's going to become one. And therefore, because of that, my father loves me because I lay down my life. And we are told in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, that Yeshua is dying to accomplish, among other things, to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. John chapter 11, verse 49, Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest, that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for that nation. Who is Caiaphas prophesying that Yeshua would die for? It's the southern kingdom. It's the house of Judah. It's the Jewish people. But then he goes on to say in John chapter 11, verse 52, and not for that nation only. So Caiaphas is prophesying that Yeshua would die for that nation, the Jewish people, but not for that nation only. So now he's dying for two different nations. And who are these two different nations? How are they described in John chapter 11, verse 52? That he would gather together in one the children of God scattered abroad. So who in the first century are two nations, two kingdoms, two sheepfolds, who are the children of God and who are scattered abroad and who are prophesied both in the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 6, and in the prophets to become one. Well, that's northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And so now, in looking at this teaching from the big picture once again, we started out the teaching with Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, where Yeshua was asked by his disciples, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And this is found in Luke chapter 21 and verse 7 in Luke's version. So in Luke chapter 21, Yeshua answered the question after he gave them variety of signs to look for before they see the sign. And then he says in Luke chapter 21, verse 27, that you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And so he said he's going to be coming in a cloud, but also in great glory. And so how do we understand the return of Yeshua coming in great glory? And he's coming in a cloud. Well, we take it back to the Torah, given that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth, John chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 10. And Paul explained it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He made covenant with Abraham. He gave the Torah at Mount Sinai that it was Yeshua who said the words to Moses in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the one that spoke those words to Moses is the one that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the one that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he led them in the wilderness by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it says, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them. 
the way and by night in a pillar of fire. And then in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And so the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is called the glory of the Lord. Yeshua is the glory of the Lord. Yeshua is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We can see how Yeshua is the glory of of God in Revelation chapter 21 verse 23 describing the new Jerusalem it says the city has no need of the sun neither the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light Yeshua is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world John chapter 1 verse 29 and the lamb is the light of the new Jerusalem And the new Jerusalem is lit by the glory of God. Yeshua is going to return when he gathers and unites the exiles of Israel. In Psalm 102 verse 13 it says, You will arise and have mercy upon Zion. The set time to favor her has come. Psalm 102 verse 16, When the Lord builds up Zion, he will appear in his glory. So when is Yeshua going to appear in his glory? When he builds up Zion. Well, the building up of Zion is the same as the building up of Jerusalem because Jerusalem and Zion are synonymous terms. We can see this in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, the last part of the verse. Out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So this is parallelism, that Zion and Jerusalem are synonymous with each other, and the Torah and the word of the Lord are synonymous with each other. So it says in Psalm 147 verse 2, the Lord builds up Jerusalem, which is the same as building up of Zion. What is the building up of Jerusalem, he gathers together the outcasts of Israel. So when Yeshua builds up Jerusalem, when he builds up Zion, when he gathers the outcasts of Israel, then he will appear in his glory. Now from the book Made in Heaven by Rabbi Ari Kaplan, on page 192, he explains from Isaiah chapter 4 verse 5. The hoopah, which is the wedding canopy, is related in the Bible to a cloud of glory. Because it says in Isaiah 4, 5, over all the glory shall be a hoopah, a wedding canopy. So the full verse in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5 reads, and the Lord will create, that's future, upon every dwelling place that's more than one of Mount Zion and the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14 in verse 1 are with the lamb on Mount Zion and what are they doing there they're playing harps and they're singing a new song and as we went over earlier in the teaching that the playing of the harp is not done in Babylon because your harp is hanging on a willow that you can only play that harp when you're not in Babylon, which means you're not in exile. And so the lamb and the 144,000 are on Mount Zion playing their harps because it represents that the nation of Israel are no longer in exile. And so upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, And upon her assemblies, plural, will be a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. And so on every dwelling place of Mount Zion is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. For upon all the glory, that's because the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is the glory of the Lord. For upon all the glory shall be a hoopah. So Yeshua's return for his bride, he's going to be coming back in glory. And how will he be returning for his bride? He's going to, at midnight, during the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, uh, 
He's going to be gathering in, uniting the exiles of Israel. Northern kingdom is going to be united with southern kingdom. And Yeshua's bride, who is betrothed to him, is to be awaiting his return to accomplish that task. And in order to be ready and prepared, you have to have your lamp burning, which means you have to have a knowledge and an understanding of the Torah that explains that it's the Messiah who's going to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. So we can see in scripture that the exiles are gathered by the glory of God, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 2, they will see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. You see, in the wilderness, you could see the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And what's associated with seeing the glory of the Lord, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and they will come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy and they will obtain joy and gladness. In Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 21, it is written, I will set my glory among the nations. So there's going to be multiple cloud by days and pillar of fire by night in the nations of the world because Yeshua's exiles are scattered in the nations of the world. And in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 25, after it says, I will set my glory among the nations, it goes on to say, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. So ending the exile of Jacob is associated with setting his glory among the nations. So it's the wise virgins who are ready for the marriage. Matthew chapter 25, verse 10. And while they went to buy, that's the foolish virgin. So what are they going to buy? They're trying to understand that Yeshua's second coming is about his role to gather and unite the, the 12 tribes of Israel and understanding this through knowing what the Torah and the prophets say because this is not what Christians are taught in traditional Christianity that they are to be waiting for Yeshua to return at his second coming to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel they're not hearing that message in traditional Christianity and so they have to go somewhere to hear it to learn it to buy the oil that they need but as they went to buy because it's the time of Jacob's trouble and great tribulation and during the time of Jacob's trouble and great tribulation that the beast is going to be ruling for 42 months and he's going to then have it so that at this time that no one may buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. This is why the foolish virgins, even though they are desiring to go and buy the oil that they need, they run out of time. And so as they were, and those that were ready, that is the wise virgins, that those that were ready, they went in with Yeshua to the marriage and the door was shut. They're consummating the marriage. And so the bride of Yeshua will make herself ready. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. So let's summarize this last part of the teaching on understanding the parable of the ten virgins. Number one, Yeshua rejected the five foolish virgins because they didn't know him intimately, because they didn't know that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and they weren't living their lives in pursuit of following his Torah. Yeshua 
gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And those who do the will of the Father will rule and reign with Yeshua in his kingdom. The will of the God of Israel is to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah and to follow Yeshua's Torah by his Holy Spirit. Yeshua will gather the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeshua died on the tree to accomplish the ultimate task and purpose of gathering and uniting the 12 tribes of Israel, which is done at his second coming. So Yeshua will complete the task to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel when he returns for his bride at the second coming. Yeshua will gather the exiles of Israel, leading them by the cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. And the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is the glory of the Lord, and Yeshua is the glory of the Lord. And when Yeshua gathers the exiles of Israel, he will be glorified. The cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is associated with a hoopah, a wedding canopy. And the wise virgins are ready for the marriage. They're prepared and ready for Yeshua's return to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. And he will do this in great glory. And so now we can understand the connection to Yeshua's answer that he gave to the disciples who asked the question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The sign of Yeshua's return is that before he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, you will see Yeshua in the form of multiple cloud by days and pillar of fire by night, gathering his people, the exiles of Israel, and bring them back to the land of Israel. And so Yeshua instructed that when you see him do that, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. The end of the exile is the redemption of Jacob. And the redemption is finalized when Yeshua sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and judges the nations, and he sets up his kingdom where he will be teaching the Torah to all nations, as we see in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and his bride will be ruling with him as kings and priests on the earth, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. So I pray that this message has been a blessing to you in helping you to understand the Hebraic background and understanding to the parable of the ten virgins and it's linked to Yeshua's role to return for his bride and end the exile of the twelve tribes of Israel. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.